Well, I'm gonna, we're going to talk. We're going to continue in a series of sermons about uh, words that the world has corrupted, but are so important to our following of Jesus, so important to our own discipleship. Uh, it's, I, I, we we believers live in two different worlds. We live in a heavenly kingdom, uh, but we also live in an earthly kingdom. One kingdom is perfect. One kingdom is not. Uh, and our role in this earthly kingdom is to shed the light of heaven where we are here. Uh, I always think of uh, the hymn, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane that I have found. Lord, help my feet on, put my feet on higher ground. And on that higher ground, that is our primary residence. That is where we live. And this is what we need to understand is words take on a different meaning there than they have here on earth. And these are some of the words that we talk about that we've been acclimated to respond to uh, emotionally and even in a visceral way uh, to these words that are wonderful words in, the heaven, of, in, in, the, in, in heaven, in the realm of God uh, where we live. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to a word like this, and we're going to read about part of the kingdom of man, and I'd like you to imagine something with me. Uh, this uh, is a made-up story, just so you know that. My wife told me to emphasize that when I told it. Uh, but let's pretend that my wife, Anne, who was out at the campground, I was wondering, what is it going to look like here Sunday morning when you take 250 ladies out of the church, Right. And my wife says, we wonder how many men are going to come without their wives to thunk them in the head this morning. So, no, my wife has never had to thunk me in the head one time to get me to church. Uh, she thunks me in the head for plenty of other things, though, so uh, I knew what that meant. But let's imagine my wife, Anne, comes home from her work uh, as an employee in a local manufacturer in the human resources department. And I say to her, sweetheart, how was work today? And she sighs. And she says, well, since you ask. And she begins to tell me how awful just about everything in her day went. Her boss called her into his office three different times, gave her three very unpleasant tasks that were really his responsibility, but he didn't want to have to deal with several particularly difficult individuals. And then she found out, in a roundabout way, that her immediate supervisor had quietly blamed her for the lateness of a report that she had never even been given to deliver. At the end of the day, her boss calls her into the office one last time to go over her annual employee evaluation. First, he tells her that the company is having one of its best years ever, thanks to employees like her. He tells her how wonderful she is and how much he appreciates all that she does. And then, after a boatload of praise, he informs her that he is, she is being given an overall ranking of three on a one to five scale. And she'll be getting a 0.02% raise for the coming year. Beaten down, she cried in the car most of the way home, and now she walks into the house and she is sad, she is angry, and she's fighting feelings of worthlessness. She doesn't feel appreciated right now, and she just wants some alone time with Jesus. I nod my head, a man who lives in that higher ground all of the time, and I understand and offer her just one piece of advice. Sweetheart, you just need to be more submissive. That's kind of, the, that's kind of what I was expecting from you guys. <laughs> and at that point, the pressure cooker, pressure cooker finally blows up. Now, one of the themes of our messages on discipleship or the demands of discipleship has been our need to understand certain terms from the perspective of kingdom dynamics. And as members of the kingdom of God's words like obedience, words like repentance, 
And as we'll discuss today, words like submission should be understood and processed in a whole new light. And that is the light of God. And these are words that the darkness of the world has corrupted. And they, like us, need to be redeemed. This is what Jesus does as he teaches his disciples how to walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So first, I'd like you to take your Bibles and join me in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Now the primary portion of scripture we're going to look at this morning is in Matthew chapter 11. But let's do a run up to that. And just kind of a quick overview. These are kind of, you're probably going to be able to follow this by subtitles in your Bible, I think. Uh, most Bibles, if you're using an ESV. In chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, and we're not going to read all of this this morning, but verses 1 through 4 reviews the calling, Jesus' calling of, of the 12 apostles. Verses 5 through 15 then describes a period of their training as Jesus sends out the 12 uh, to do the things that he has taught them to do. And for them, this is part of an internship we might compare it to. And then in verses 16 through 23, he teaches them what to expect from the world as they do the, fa the Father's will as followers of Jesus. Now, this is not a pretty picture. It's a rather a forewarning of persecution that will await them. And as I've read, and as I read these verses, I want you to take note of how many of the characters mentioned, and I'm going to read verses 16 through 23 here in just a minute. Pay attention to how many of the characters mentioned are individuals who expect submission from them. In other words, these are people in authority and have authority over these apostles in a worldly sense. Jesus tells these apostles in verse 16, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver over brother to death and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death because of the message you are going to bring. Verse 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in the town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes." Is it any wonder that we have a bad taste in our mouth regarding submission to the authorities of this world in our lives? Okay. Verse 26 through 33 of the same chapter, Jesus tells his followers that regardless of all of those things that will happen, they are to have no fear. Verses 34 through 39, he continues to forewarn them of what their obedience will uh, what their obedience to him will bring about. Verse 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against, his, against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemy will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, 
And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You are bringing a message to the world that is so drastically countercultural. People are going to hate you. And families are going to be divided. What are they going to be divided over? They're going to be divided over what they believe and the truth of God that you are going to bring them. But we cannot leave them wallowing in the lies. We have to bring them the life-giving truth. And there's going to be a price to pay for that. Serving the kingdom of God will put you in direct conflict with the kingdoms of humanity. Even your own family, if they are not following Jesus. Quick show of hands here, real quick. How many live in families that are divided as far as faith goes? Just raise your hands. Raise them high. Raise them high. Most of the people in this room. So you have a special understanding of that. Kingdoms of this world use the corrupted weapons of this world to contend against one another in worldly conflicts. We see this on the news every night. We see it in our lives every day as we interact in this world. I've had many individuals coming to me seeking counsel as to how does one compete in worldly systems as a Christian. The competition is driven by greed and motivated by profit and power and notoriety. Lying and cheating and deceit and slander and gossip and flattery and pandering in order to get ahead are deeply embedded in the human psyche. So much so that many of us are operating in these very systems and to us, they seem normative. I know that because I have for years. They are all ways that are common to man. They are not fair, nor are they just. And we ask ourselves, what can a Christian do and not compromise their faith? The answer is always, we serve God first. That's my answer, always. We serve God first. We're on loan from God, <laughs> and we represent him here on this earth. We serve God first. Systems of this world are secondary to us. Our ways are to be marked by truth and encouragement and hard work and beauty and creativity, and order, and justice, and productivity. In the workplace, Christians are to be known as godlike people, showing others love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and goodness, and kindness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. For many of us, that's enough to make us valuable enough to the company not to get rid of us. And if we're owners, we can set the tone for the entire company. We are not to conform to this world, but rather be transformed by God so that we can transform the world around us. We are not to lose faith or allow discouragement to rule in our hearts. I'm going to read the words to a hymn, and I want you to see this is remedial learning, by the way. I want to see if you can guess the name of the hymn. Okay? Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. At school, in the workplace, wherever you are. Why? Because God will take care of you. The refrain goes, God will take care of you through every day or all the way he will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through days of toil, when your heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. 
All you may need, he will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast. God will take care of you. Okay, here's the big question. What do you think the title of that hymn is? (laughs) Say it. God will take care of you. Okay? He will. He might not take care of the way you want to be taken care of, but he will take care of you. (laughs) When we get to chapter 11, we move down to a verse that has to do with submission. It's one of the most famous submission portions of Scripture in the Bible, and it's in verse 28 of chapter 11. And I want you to look at this verse in light of what we just read about what the disciples are going, you know, he has just called them to to himself. He just sent them out and he told them how terrible everything is going to be for them. And he keeps repeating this call. And in verse 28, he says, come to me again, who all who labor and are heavy laden. See, this is what the world puts upon people. This is what the world puts upon us as believers. And Jesus says, I will give you rest from all that stuff. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and I am lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus is setting himself up in stark contrast to all other authorities in the world. Okay? All other authorities will leave you heavy laden and burdened. They will not be gentle. They will not be lowly of heart. And you will not find rest for your soul. Now you might be, I know some of you who are contrarians like I can be. You say, you know, I've had some non-believing bosses who are really good this way. God bless you, that's good. There are some. But know that when they are doing it that way, they're doing it Jesus' way. Okay? And my guess is Jesus wasn't too far behind generationally. Okay? Jesus' yoke. Jesus' yoke. Let's talk about yoke dynamics. <laughs> wow. I think that might have been the first time in my preaching history where I looked at the clock and actually felt good when I saw it. Okay? <laughs> wow. I love Jesus' analogy of the yoke. It is a picture of animals that are yoked together in order to move efficiently and accomplish work together. Concerning the yoke, there is so much that could be said that we don't have time to say, but first consider the work dynamics, the dynamics of the yoke. Dynamics are the study of motion, okay? Dynamics are the study of motion, the manner in which different forces produce motion to bring about change. Relate that to two animals yoked together. It's about motion, two forces put together to bring about change. Two animals plowing a field, two animals pulling a cart, two animals working a machine together, walking in circles. Dynamics also define relationships between forces. Jesus tells us that under his yoke, we will move together in relationship to bring about change in this world on behalf of his kingdom. So when we commit to become followers of Jesus, we are committing to at least three things. Submission to Christ, work for Christ, and relationship in Christ. Okay? When you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are committing to 
<laughs> wear his yoke, which will mean submission and work and relationship. Your submission is the calling to which we have freely given ourselves. In the world, you will be forced into submission. Okay? I have to pay my taxes. Okay? Okay. There are certain things I have to do because authority over me tells me I have to do it. But when we follow Jesus, we do that of our own volition. We choose you this day whom ye will serve. I'm not, I know one of the Sunday school classes is talking about Arminianism and Calvinism today. But I want you to go there in your mind. Just understand that just as the, just as the groom chooses the bride, the bride needs to choose the groom also. We have freely given ourselves to Christ and to follow him. In a biblical sense, submission is yielding to others for their own good. I want you to think of submission that way. Submission is yielding to others for their own good, for our own good, for the good of the kingdom. All Christians are told that holy living demands that we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians 5, 20, 21, I think. This means that we must put the best interest of others ahead of our own interests. And this presupposes that the best interests of all parties are the interests of God, who alone perfectly cares for all of his children without prejudice. So when we put on Christ's yoke, we are working for him with one another. Submission to a believer is submission to perfection. Submission in this world is never submission to perfection. Okay? But submission to God is our submission to one who is perfect. It is submission to our God who is perfect in knowledge, perfect in power, perfect in love, perfect in justice. He who works out all things for the good of those who fear him and are called according to his purposes. This submission must be seen in sharp contrast to the kind of submission we are often subjected to in this world. Sometimes forced submission to powers that are often doing the work of evil and who often, in a secondary sense, then make us complicit in their sinful ways. No wonder we don't like submission. And then we labor, or when we labor under the yoke of Jesus, we must constantly be aware of one another so that we do not work against one another. Do you ever work with a bunch of Christians? Hey, Pat, do you ever work with a bunch of Christians? Yeah. You know what the first thing he said was? <laughs> Yeah, not always perfect, okay? We wear the yoke of Christ so that we can work together in him and so that we don't work against one another. Always sensing, always sensing one another's presence, helping each other in our weaknesses, Restraining one another if one of us starts to pull away from the path before us. Together we keep ourselves from going too fast or from going too slow. And hopefully we're going to see this dynamic at play at our business meeting tonight. It'll be interesting to see if the trustees are ready to fix the slope on the east-west sidewalk out here that leads down to the parking lot from the office doors. Pastor Dale Maher reminded the church pretty pointedly in our last business meeting that was long overdue and we needed to get that project going. How many remember that when Dale did that, okay? He was, had his neck in the yoke and he was pushing, okay? We're gonna see if the trustees are gonna move with Dale. Most of the church thought Dale was doing a good thing. We could all sense Dale's pulling us all along out of our complacency at that last meeting. 
Anybody want to make any bets? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. We don't do that here. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> Next thing we do as believers in the yoke is we work. We work. There's a willingness to expend ourselves on behalf of our calling. Jesus says, follow me. And we must be willing to do the work that needs to be done in order to follow Jesus and do what he does. <laughs> on my first full day as a ranch hand, my foreman drove me to the prairie land of central Nebraska. We were miles from the ranch. He pulled the truck off the road next to a single cedar fence post that stood near a stack of similar posts. He pulled a jug of water and a post hole digger out of the bed of the truck and said, do you know how to use one of these? <laughs> yes, sir, I said. Okay, start laying down posts going south. <laughs> Stay 30 feet from the road. Keep them lined up straight. If you don't, you're going to be here tomorrow pulling them out. He pulled a six-foot piece of iron about two inches in diameter out of the truck and said, this is for tamping. You know what tamping is? Yes, sir, I replied. I'll be back at lunch. Uh, watch out for rattlers. He jumped in the truck and he drove away. He never came to get me at lunchtime. So I just worked, is what I had signed up for. When you commit yourself to a task, you work. You expend yourself on behalf of the ultimate goal. And I thought to myself, whenever he gets back, I'm going to have a lot of fence poles put in that ground. Okay. This is what committed people do. They work. I want you to think about your relationship with Christ. I want you to think about your work. Are you in the yoke, pulling along with the rest of the body of Christ, and are you working on behalf of Christ in this world? God gave you gifts, God gave you talents, God gave you abilities. He's given you opportunities to hone them. If he hasn't yet, he will through the church. What are you doing alongside other believers? If you're overburdened, if you're frustrated, if life is too hard, then you're not doing the work the way God wants it done. Because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And you're doing it without him. And that's why things aren't working out the way maybe you would hope that they worked out in your life. The last thing we have is relationship. James Montgomery Boyce, who is one of my favorite commentators, I tell you that probably too often, uh, he uses the word companionship here. Discipleship demands companionship. Following Jesus with others demands companionship or relationship. The yoke may be understood as Jesus who has yoked believers together as we help one another follow him, accomplishing his work on earth together, bound together in his love. I am constantly reminded that the fruit of the Spirit is wholly relational as God enables us to move together in him. If you work with Christians, you will need love for them because that will overcome a multitude of problems, sins. You will need to be able to manufacture joy of the Lord, draw on God's joy when it doesn't really make sense, humanly speaking, if you're working with people, not just Christians, but anybody else. The reason it's harder to work with Christians is because we have higher expectations for them that are often unrealistic. 
because they're just sinners saved by grace like everybody else. Older, mature believers who have learned to walk in Christ move under the power of his grace and in the direction that Christ lead and we share the yoke with them. The younger believers share that yoke and the church moves forward in him. That's one way of looking at the yoke. There's another way. The yoke may be understood as a tool that Jesus uses to bind us to him. He is in the yoke with us. He has been given these instructions by God the Father and he is faithful to him. He leads and we move with him in his yoke. He supplies the power and he supplies the direction. And where we go, he goes and we strain with him, but only to the degree that we are capable. He carries the load and his power makes our burden light. I'd like to remind us all of a very important truth as we close. To be yoked to Jesus is to be yoked to the rest of his bride. Okay? We are yoked to one another in him. To be yoked to Jesus is to be yoked to the church. However, being yoked to the church would be a miserable and an unbearable task were it not for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who liberally supplies all that we need to move efficiently together in peace. But if we don't appropriate God in our lives to give us the love for one another, to give us the joy that we need, to give us the peace that we need in the middle of conflict, to give us the ability to be patient with one another when our patience has run out, to give us the desire and the ability to be good to one another and not snap at one another, to give us the ability to be kind to one another, even when people are not being kind to us, to give us the ability to be gentle with our words with one another and faithful to God and faithful to one another throughout the task we've been given and self-control to keep it together as we move together in him. If we do not avail ourselves of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the yoke of the church will certainly be too much for anyone to bear. So we commit ourselves to Jesus. We commit ourselves to one another. The first and the greatest commandment and the second which is like it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. And love your neighbor as you would love yourself. We simply cannot justify a commitment to walk with Jesus with a withdrawal from the body, with a withdrawal from the bride of Christ that he loves for whom he died. Matthew Henry, old commentator. I read him a lot because his commentaries are always free online. That's how old he is, okay? He's dead. (laughs) Nobody's demanding money for Matthew Henry's commentary, but they're always worth the read. He wrote this. We are yoked to work, and therefore we must be diligent in our work. We are yoked to submit, and therefore we must be humble and patient with one another. And we are yoked together with our fellow servants, and therefore we must keep up the communion of the saints, gathering together in him, worshiping together in him, walking together in him, serving together in him. And you know what? When it works, it is a beautiful 
thing, a beautiful thing. And the world looks at it and they don't get it. And our job is to make it so compelling that they want to be part of what God has given us here. Him. Amen? Stand with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, I'm aware that I know there are some here, Lord, who have never put their faith in you. They're just getting to know you, Lord. Perhaps, Lord, some who have heard these things for the first time. Oh, Lord, I pray that your spirit might call them this morning and that they might see the beauty of your word, your way, that you would put in their hearts a desire, Lord, to know you, to walk with you, to taste of your goodness and take that step, Lord, from this world that is so often marked with pain and sorrow into the kingdom of God where the task will be difficult but oh so rewarding and the promise of heaven Lord at the end of the road Lord may your spirit call their name and may they trust you in faith with their lives Lord for us who have already taken that step I pray that you would refresh our spirits in you and Lord, help us to see this world through your eyes. Help us to love the people of this world, Lord. Give us hearts for them and for their salvation as we follow you. We thank you, Lord. We are a blessed people. And forgive us when we forget. And we pray these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, our friend, our brother. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.